Our tradition at Leadership Austin is we always end Engage Breakfast the season with a conversation with the mayor and the county judge. Our state of the community conversation, as we call it. This is the fourth year we've done that. Unfortunately, Judge Eckhart is traveling this year, and she said she's very sorry to miss the conversation. So Mayor Adler is here to carry the full load. It's a lot more fun when we're both here. <laughs> yeah, you guys uh, play off each other well, but today <coughs> it's just the two of us, and uh, we're going to find out what's on your mind. This is an election year, so we're going to try not to get too political and do do more perspective on um, your evaluation of, of how you think the city's doing, your leadership, and, and where we are as a community. I, I want to start with something kind of interesting that I saw in the newspaper this morning, the finger voting. What, what is that all about? <laughs> Well, first, first, let me say thank you for the opportunity to, to, to come back. You know, from the, from the vantage point that I have right now, you have a different perspective on what leadership is in the community. There's a, a, a leadership structure in this community that happens outside of government. And uh, this is one of the few organizations that is continually pumping new leadership into that informal structure. Uh, so that's incredibly valuable. And then real fast with Toy, I want to put a plug in for people to participate in that uh, training. Beyond Diversity uh, Training. Beyond Diversity Training. Uh, Glenn uh, and that group, quite frankly, he's the best trainer I think that I have seen in any training on any subject. Uh, just so happens that this one happens to be about something that's real important to us in this community. So. I would really encourage people to go on, on lots of levels. It sounds like it's life-changing for people who have been through it. I'm, I'm planning to go through it in July. So it is. Exciting. I mean, the, the people that have come back, the, the data and statistics is pretty mm -hmm. incredible, the, the information. And in a city like Austin where so many things are going right, uh, really our Achilles heel in this city is that it is not shared by everyone, and we all say that. But then what do you do about that? How do you change things in, in access to capital and in uh, housing and health care delivery. How do you really fundamentally change that? It's a cultural change. It's a systemic or institutional change. Uh, and that's what this program really gets to. So I, I was kind Sorry. of joking about the finger voting, but, but no. I, I, I know that you started something where you're holding up a certain number of fingers to show the support on the council. I just thought it was interesting. We haven't, and, and Ken, Ken wrote about that uh, in, in yeah. the article today. So we have an incredibly uh, 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 contentious issue in Code Next. Uh, it's something that's become even more contentious because it's been caught up, I think, in the same kind of, of, of rhetorical debate that we see happening at the national level. Uh, where uh, it just becomes so easy to, to demonize people that think differently than, than you do. Uh, you know, there, there are lots of, of issues associated with, with Code Next, uh, but the one thing I know for sure is that it does not have racist NIMBY people on one side and greedy developers out for a personal interest on the other side. Uh, but yet, if you hear a lot of the discussion, it goes to those places or close to those places, which means that the issue becomes even more heightened and even more emotional and even more critical. So uh, we just went through uh, the process in the community. It goes to the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission starts meeting, and they realize quickly that they have seven votes on one side and six votes on the other side, and the people with seven votes realize they can pass lots of stuff, seven to six, uh, and that's really how the first day starts. I went to some of the Planning Commission people, and I said, you know, that's not as helpful as, as what would really be good for us. Why don't you see what you guys can agree to with, with eight votes or nine votes or 10 votes or 12 votes and, and let the community see that, and then they started doing that, and they. They came to, uh, I thought, a, a surprising number of votes that were 13-0 and 12-1 and 10-3. And um, so now it comes to the city council, and city council, the 11 of us, are, are, are looking at each other, and, and I could see people counting votes again on the council dais to see what we could get done 6-5. to five. And I suggested to my colleagues that that really wasn't a good place for us to start either, that that really the community is looking to the council to, to try to work with this in a way that brings us all 
closer together and that recognizes that there is truth in what both sides are saying and that everyone's worst fears just will not be realized in this process. So I borrowed on something that a consultant had used with us in going through the strategic plan and it's you introduce a subject, uh, you talk about it and then people give indications of where they are going from five down to zero. Um, and, and a five vote means I love it unconditionally, four is I like it with some changes, three is I could support it as it is, but I would like some changes, two is uh, uh, I have concerns about it and couldn't vote for it the way that it was, one is I really don't like it, and zero is I'll work against it. Uh, so we have a conversation and people just give a, a, a show of hands by way of indication. It's a different way to debate. And what we're in search for is, is trying to find propositions or beliefs where, where eight or more members of the council could give a three or more indication. And if we get to that level of consensus, then we'll move on to the next thing. If we can't, we'll keep talking about it. Until, until the numbers change. <laughs> until either the numbers change or, or we you, say you just can't, we're not we going to get there. Okay. So then we so this is the first full term of the single member district council. And I'm just wondering, what do you think has worked well under the single member district? This is a huge change for the city of Austin. And what do you think still needs some fine tuning or really hasn't worked too well? You know, I think what's worked best is, is what was intended to happen with the district. There are now more voices sitting at the council table than we have ever had before. Uh, with council members that had all pretty much come from one part of the city where they lived, mm -hmm. the voices uh, uh, outside of the center city really, really weren't heard uh, at the council table. Now there's someone from the, the Northwest uh, comes with a very different perspective, both members uh, of the council that have come from the Northwest. Uh, but also from the Southwest and from the Southeast and the Northeast and the East. You have fundamentally different voices, which means that the priorities in some respects have changed uh, on the council to reflect what's happening in the city. Uh, so I think that that, the, that has been, um, has worked really well and done exactly what it was intended to do. I think that the, 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 the challenges associated with the 10-1 council in part is just the sheer number of people. We now have 11 people uh, on, the, on the council. Uh, and, and this is, we haven't figured out yet exactly how it is that we can delegate work among the 11 of us to work efficiently. So we've tried several different attempts at trying to put together a committee system where subgroups of the council can advance things and we haven't figured that out well yet. Uh, so, so everything's really coming to the council, everything's being debated. I think that's one of the reasons why um, uh, meetings in Austin take as, as long as they do. Um, <laughs> although I think we're... You do have some lengthy council meetings here. We do. Uh, fewer ones that are going past midnight now than in the past, but, but still more, more, more work to be done. So since Austin is really a city manager <laughs> form of government, I want to talk about the decision to hire Spencer Cronk because he plays a very important role in how our city moves forward. What were you as a council looking for in that new city manager? And, and why was um, Mr. Cronk the, the choice that you really put above the rest? Uh, I'm excited uh, that, that uh, Spencer Cronk is here. And it is, as you say, critically important because he's the CEO of the, of the city. Uh, I think we were looking for somebody that could, could work to, to bring the community together on, on issues. There are so many things, again, that are working well. Uh, that uh, I'm not sure anybody thought there needed to be an abrupt course change. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there were, there, there's, a, there's a cohesion uh, element uh, that, that it would be good to have in the community because we are divided on some cultural issues the, the, where the tectonic plates are uh, that you really feel in a fast growing, growing, growing city. I think that what we were most impressed with uh, Spencer Cronk was learning. Uh, that he, in his present position, or his prior position as administrator in Minneapolis, moved into a job that had five people in that job in a little over a two-year period of time. So it was known as a job that was absolutely impossible for anybody. 
and it was impossible because they have a system there that has a little bit stronger mayor than we have, but, but, but not a lot stronger. So there was um, a contention between the, the mayor and the city council. Uh, he joined as, as the administrator, uh, but there were uh, 10 different department heads, and he was one of them. Uh, and none of the 10 had any authority over the, none of the 11 had a, any authority over one another. So they were all equals. His job uh, was basically the back of the house stuff, the administrative stuff for the city. Uh, but, but those people didn't get along well with each other. And in that job for um, a little under three years, he had gotten to the place where the council and the mayor were working really well together. And he was the de facto chief uh, among the uh, department heads. In fact, he was doing the, the personnel reviews uh, for uh, his uh, uh, peer group. Uh, and you heard that at every stage when he was in Minneapolis. That's, he was described as someone that could put together teams, move people forward, a really effective listener. Uh, somebody that not only listened, but then tried to incorporate what he was hearing into his conclusions. And you heard the same thing about his time in the state uh, government in Minneapolis. You heard the same thing about his work in New York with Bloomberg, uh, mayor there who um, uh, I thought has trained some of the best uh, municipal administrators that we have in the country that are all over the country right now. Uh, so I think it was that aspect. What have you learned about yourself in this leadership role? Um, and what qualities do you think you need to work on? <laughs> I've learned that, that I don't need as much sleep as I thought that I did. <laughs> Is that a leadership quality? <laughs> Sometimes. Uh, you know, I... I I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a patient person, uh, and, and I think that in the council that we've had, that has, that has uh, have held good stead for me, uh, trying to, to keep a group of people together that uh, have very disparate interests in a new 10-1 system. You know, one of the reasons that I, that I ran when we moved to this 10-1 system was because uh, I and, 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 and many others had made the observation that cities and counties that move to a 10-1 system, almost all of them fail uh, in the first four to six years. Uh, almost all of them uh, fail. And the reason for that is because it quickly devolves into a ward politics system. Someone is finally elected from a district that has not felt like it's had a voice for 30 years and there's been one thing that they really wanted to have for 30 years. Now, it might be really good for the district, but it also might not be really good for the city generally. But now they have an elected representative, and the one thing they want from that representative is for that representative to deliver on that one thing. Well, in many cities and counties, everybody arrives with that one thing they need to deliver on that may not be good for the city, and they realize that if a majority of them get together, they can give to each other the one thing that their constituents want, and they can all take home what they want, even though none of those things might be in the best interest of the city. And that, that's something, that, that something like that uh, happens in so many places. We've done a really good job, I think, of avoiding that. and, and mm -hmm. Uh, we have worked uh, certainly with very strong district advocates, but really remarkably well, I think, we've worked in the city's interest. So I think that that, uh, that measure of, of patience and trying to, to uh, elevate the voices of the people on my peers and colleagues on the council is something that, that I'm proud of and I think has worked well. Uh, what, what hasn't worked well is, is, is when I've gotten in the most trouble, it's when I have um, um, tried to work more quickly than the system allows mm. something to, to happen. Uh, and every time that happens and I've tried to do that, I've gotten punished for, for, for doing that. Uh, but, it's, but it's a lesson that's hard to learn when you come out of the private sector. When you come out of the private sector, your focus is on, on results and on efficiency. 
uh, because that's what enables you to compete well in the private sector. In government, the priorities are different. In government, the, the greater priority is on engagement uh, of the community and on transparency. Uh, but those things uh, work against the concept of efficiency almost by definition. It's just a different priority setting. Uh, so that, that transition is, is something that uh, 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 I haven't handled as best I should on a few occasions. That was an honest answer. Thank you. So I, I want to talk a little bit about race because it's so front and center in Austin and there, there seems to be a lot of divisions and I know that we've been talking about this beyond diversity training and courageous conversations which are wonderful and you, you had the task force, the mayor's task force um, on racial inequities. I want to talk about that report and, and what action is actually stemming from, from that particular report. I know discretionary arrests are going to be before the council t on tomorrow, and that's a big racial issue. So, so give us a, a framework for this. Well, again, you know, there are so many things that are happening so well in this city, uh, but it's not shared. There is a 10-year uh, difference in life expectancy if you live on the west side of town or if you live on the east side of town. Uh, that's among the, the indicia. And when you think about the impact that 10 additional years in life have for someone to be able to spend with their family or with their children as they get older or to be able to accumulate wealth to be able to, to hand down, uh, it's, there's, that differential is, is, is an Achilles heel in this city. Uh, but it's just not there. It's in, it's in access to capital issues. You see the same thing in delivery of health care issues. You see it in housing. You see it in education. Uh, you know, to, to, to recognize that there are racial disparities that arise from the institutions that we've set up over a long period of time, both private and public, is not to say that the people in those institutions are racists but it's to recognize that there is a significant racial impact. You know, when you look at the numbers, you can see that, that if you look at so many different things, uh, uh, educational, uh, even when you control for things like educational achievement or you control for, for wealth and, and income, you still see uh, health disparities regardless of, of which element which which standard you look at that's true both among all poor people it's true among all rich people you see those same kind of institutional and systemic indications so it's important for a community to to take a look at those and and try to make itself better in a community so the task force on institutional racism and systemic inequities was one that was designed to take an honest look at that there was some reticence uh, about naming a task force that way. And I received a lot of requests from people that said, can't you call it something else? Can't you call it uh, institutional barriers or something like that? Uh, because the word institutional racism is too charged. Uh, but my belief was is that the more people suggested to me that I call it something other than institutional racism, it became more and more clear to me that that's really what I needed to call it. Um, because that's really the term to describe what it is that we were trying to address. But it was a group that was asked not to come together to describe the challenge or the problem. Yet again, we've done that so many yes, times. Yes, many, many times. Solutions. But, but to come up with solutions. Yeah. And they came up with over 250 recommendations. And, and, and the last time I looked, 60 of them had already been implemented. 90 of them were in the process of being implemented. And one of them was to take as many people as we could to that courageous conversation beyond diversity. And I think probably there are close to a thousand leaders in this community that have done that. We now have um, uh, leadership in the banking community in this city, competitors that have never met together as a group that are now meeting as a group on this issue and on access to capital issues. The more leaders we can get in the community to go through this, the less, less threatening the, the topic is, uh, the, the, more, the easier it is for us to be able to discuss the challenges that we, that we, that, that we face. This is not unique to us. 
Uh, it certainly is institutionally baked in and part of because of where we are as a southern as a southern city. Uh, but we do have a, a community, I think, that can look at this honestly uh, and actually do something, uh, do something about it. Where do you think discretionary arrests fit into the picture? Because I know that's going to be a big topic for the council tomorrow. Well, you know, when you look at, uh, uh, and again, you know, I, we're looking at discretionary arrests, but it's important to, to again recognize that that you could find this same kind of thing almost anywhere you look in any industry or subject area in this city. Uh, but one of the council members saw a disparity where uh, among those people that are stopped for possession of marijuana, uh, the number of those people that are stopped for, if you look at the universe of, of Anglo white people that are stopped for possession of marijuana, uh, black people who are stopped for possession of marijuana, there was a, a, a striking difference between the numbers that got tickets and the numbers mm -hmm. that got arrested. And when I say striking distance, to put it in perspective, almost everyone gets a ticket for that. They don't get arrested. So you're talking about a much smaller universe, people who get arrested than the people who get tickets. Uh, but there was a disparity in those numbers. So there were two questions that were raised in this resolution. The first is a request for the chief and the police force to take a look at that and tell us why that, 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 that exists. Why does that exist? And then come back with recommendations on things that we might be able to do as a community to, to be able to address that or to better understand that. So there's that request to come back with additional information. And then this council is doing a lot, taking a look at what is the, the practical impact of, of people getting, getting arrested. Uh, we're trying to do a lot now with the homeless community. We're trying to do a lot now to, to help folks that are in poverty or near poverty to be able to move out of those areas. And one of the most significant barriers for someone being able to do that is having an arrest record or a criminal record. Uh, we've tried to address that in many different ways. One way we addressed that or tried to address that was with a fair chance hiring policy which says that when you go apply for a job, you can't be asked right away, hey, do you have a criminal background? You can only be asked that late in the, in the process because the studies and the statistics all show that people, if they're allowed to go a little bit or far enough into the interview process, employers will say, I really like this person. Now I've learned that they had a shoplifting conviction 20 years ago. I'm not, I like this person. I don't see that evidence, I'm going to hire this person. But if they had to check the application before they ever got the first interview that they had been arrested for something, they may never get the interview. So it's such a significant barrier. So we're taking a look at trying to remove that barrier economically in the city. Uh, and one place we look at it, among lots of places, is looking at those discretionary instances where someone gets a ticket or someone gets arrested. And recognizing that there's a huge social price to be paid for the decision to be arrested versus getting a ticket, we've said that we want, we want, we want to err on the side of, of, of ticketing rather than, than arresting. Not to undercut the police's, uh, law enforcement's ability to arrest anyone uh, if they're a danger, or if they're committing, a, you know, in the midst of committing a crime, if they're a threat, not taking away the, the officer's ability to be able to do that, but to but to look carefully uh, at at this practice because of the social and economic impact it has in the community, not only here but in lots of different ways. There's definitely a trickle down effect of of those arrests. Julie, I want to go to you and see if we have some questions from the audience. There's some great questions coming in. Um, a lot of them are focused on the growth that our region has seen. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing to work with the other municipalities in our region to create policies that benefit the entire region? Uh, you know, regional work in this community is, uh, is, is critical. Uh, and we've done a lot more of that over the last several years than, than ever before. Uh, that's a function uh, in part on just the changes that are happening in the region uh, as well as it's, it's been a real priority for me. So it used to be that Austin was the, the only big city urban area 
and quite frankly, our values were, were a little bit different than the, than the surrounding communities. So a lot of the regional work that happened uh, really involved um, uh, Austin kind of doing battle with the, with the surrounding areas as we had uh, environmental regulations and things that were important to us, uh, not uh, with the same priority on the surrounding communities. Transportation issues that we looked at differently because we were an urban area compared to some of the folks around us. And what we're finding now is that the fastest growing city. You know, we're the fastest growing metropolitan area in the country. But one of the reasons we're the fastest growing metropolitan area is because we have some of the fastest growing cities, like Pflugerville and San Marcos and Cedar Park. So we're finding that the areas around us are now are urbanizing as well, which means that we are beginning to have greater common cause with a lot of the surrounding areas. They're beginning to look at environmental issues the way that we do. Uh, and have, looking at transportation challenges the way that we do and, and have, which is a good thing because we're never going to be able to really do significant things about mobility or transportation except regionally. We're not going to be able to do environmental work in this area except regionally. So there's been a lot more push and effort to do that. We're finding that more of the votes on Campo, the the, the Central uh, Texas Metropolitan Planning Organization that does transportation planning are now not quite as divided as they were, or Austin and Travis County, which have a minority votes in the region on that board, are now finding themselves more in the majority of decisions that are, that are being made. And it's a real honor to have been elected as, as vice chair of that, of that group. Um, we, we, even in the environmental area, we got together with 50 surrounding jurisdictions to look at environmental issues concerning water quality uh, and collectively went to the state with a suggested rule change. Um, the, the, the thought that as Central Texas we would have done something like that collectively would have been unheard of. Uh, just a few years ago. It was received really well and then the, and, and the uh, state uh, administrative body now is, has adopted that as something that, that they're going to, to push uh, and proceed. And then, uh, so, so doing stuff regionally is critically more important and I have much deeper personal relationships right now with the mayors uh, in the surrounding community and we talk to each other uh, a lot, visit with each other a lot, give each other uh, advice and, and quite frankly pats on the back and uh, I'm really encouraged at the, at the movement toward uh, regional approach. You, you mentioned a disparate value sometimes with, with other parts of the state and other cities. Nowhere is that more glaring than at the Texas legislature and they're going to be coming back, um, the legislators are going to be coming back in, gosh, less than six months, in January. Um, we've had a lot of local issues overruled at the state level. So I'm wondering, how do you decide what policies to pass and, and what criteria do you use, knowing that some of these things may be in place for six months and then the state lawmakers are going to go, uh-uh, Austin can't do that. Well, you know, at some level we have to be true to who we are and true to, the, to our beliefs and our culture and, and our values in the, in the community. Uh, sometimes change doesn't happen in a, in a direct line. Sometimes change happens as people try something and, and then it doesn't work out or it's not accepted and then next time two cities or areas try the same thing that's how, that's how change happens over time. So the fact that Austin adopts something that then gets preempted by the state uh, may be unfortunate uh, because we can't exercise our values, uh, but I don't know that it's all, all bad and, and I don't think that that's a reason not to express views. It's interesting on the recent issue uh, with respect to earned sick leave. Um, Earned sick leave uh, is something that was, was controversial in this city, uh, but it's clearly the wave of the future. There are 40 cities around the country that have done it. There are seven states that have done it. 
In our community, over 70% of the people have earned sick leave, 30% don't. The 30% that don't are that portion of the population that, again, we're trying to move up the uh, economic chain. Uh, and our whole community will be better when we can do that. Uh, we have our city's health officer uh, here, director. Uh, you know, it has an impact on health in the community, the spread of flu during flu season. So we passed that, and, and, and immediately we had several legislators promise us that they would preempt that as soon as they had the chance to, to do that, which we all understood. But it's interesting, you know, it looks like it's now going to be on the ballot in San Antonio in November and on the ballot in Dallas in November. Uh, the, the polling would seem to indicate that in both those cities, as in Austin, over 70% of the population is in favor of, of making sure that, that everyone has some measure of earned sick leave. If that's the case and it gets passed in San Antonio and Dallas, then it's just not Austin and it's just not a city council, but it's a popular vote. So that doesn't mean the legislature won't do what they can to overturn it, though. Absolutely. The legislature, I would imagine, still probably will. But it's also going to be the first time that the legislature will have overturned and preempted something that was uh, popularly adopted in so many places and something that is as, as, as popular uh, in, in among the, the citizenry uh, as this one is. You know, it's interesting when you ask questions about preemption, this is also not the first time this has happened in the country. Uh, there was a period uh, of time, uh, the zipper law period of time. If you look back at the late 1800s, same kind of thing happened where states took away power, preempted cities because they thought cities were getting out of hand. That's where we had the first commissioner form of governments uh, imposed on, on cities. Uh, you know, the pendulum swings. Uh, uh, back at the end of the zipper period, there was a brand new movement that was created. It was called the local control movement. Uh, and that's where that started. Uh, and it was in response to uh, uh, state uh, preemption of cities. Julie, let's have some more questions from the audience. What's, what's interesting about the questions today is that they're all very specific. People want to know about transportation and affordability and parks and rec and the elderly and the immigrants. And there's so many things to address. So my question for you, Mayor, is as the council talks about economic development and growth, how do you have conversations with all of those varying needs? What does that look like as a leader? Because you have to really consider all of those issues when you make these decisions. <clears throat> you do, and what does it look like? It looks confused and disorganized and ugly, I think. Uh, when you look at a city council meeting, trying to, to, to grapple uh, with those different priorities. And they do all exist. Uh, and on any issue that comes to us at the city council, uh, we'll get lobbied pretty extensively by, by each of the, each of the, the, the competing uh, elements in the city. And part of being uh, on council is ultimately you have to sometimes make choices between uh, competing priorities. But you don't always have to make choices. And sometimes some of the best solutions are the ones that, that can be fashioned out of hearing different advocates in different areas and finding the commonalities and finding the ways to, 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 to leverage uh, ideas or combine ideas, um, to find new people that are participating in those ideas, uh, to be able to find uh, solutions that, that are different uh, than, than what people wanted. It's, it's, it's focusing less on the way people want to get things done and more on what it is that they're ultimately trying to get done because far too often people will come and be fighting over a method rather than an, than an interest. Uh, and if you can get people to step back and really focus on the interest, a lot of times you can find really good solutions. To the degree that there are people that have emailed to you uh, specific requests that we're not going to be able to get to here. I don't know if you can forward those to me uh, so that I can reply to those folks on those specific questions. I'd like to be able to do that. We'll definitely do that. This is a very active group. You'll get a lot of questions. <laughs> That's okay. Um, Bring it on. Biggest surprise and biggest disappointment since you've been in office? 
I guess the biggest surprise was just the the amount of the volume of incoming stuff. <laughs> Lots of incoming stuff. Lots of incoming <laughs> stuff. And the, and the difficulty in being proactive, because everything about this job and the council's job, I think, is built around making those folks uh, reactive. Um, you know, we, we, we handle constituent requests that come into our office, and people are saying, you know, I, I, what do I do? My utility bill's wrong, or I can't pay my utility bill, or whatever the constituent issue is. We get a lot of those. We also know that if we pick up any of those constituent issues, 90% of the time, we can help that person achieve what they want, what they're trying to achieve and they can't achieve on their own. I could spend all of my time and all of my staff's time doing nothing but responding to those kind of constituent issues. But we can't. On any given Monday, as we go through a, through a council meeting, there are 20 things that hit our table that are new to us that week, but somebody in the community or people in the community have been working on for three months or six months or three years. It's an incredibly important thing to them. And it wouldn't have gotten to us at the council if it didn't have some difficulty or challenge associated with it. And one of our jobs is to then get in. We have to make decisions to mediate those kinds of issues. Every Monday, another bunch arrives. We could spend all of my time and all of my staff's time doing nothing but reacting to those things that come in that we have to. And what we, and what we really want to be doing is spending our time trying to work on affordability at large or transportation at large to really be proactive on those things and, and to really help guide the, 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 the arc of the path of the community and, and finding and making the time or the ability to be able to be proactive and thoughtful uh, and deliberate and forward-looking is, is a hard thing to do because the system isn't set up to make it easy. What and about disappointments? What's your biggest disappointment this year, this year or in the four years you've been there? Uh, the biggest disappointment, um, the inability to be able to communicate well to 950,000 people. And I think Code Next would be an example of that. Uh, you know, we, we haven't had a Codenex product because it's a, Codenex is a process, not a product. So there's never been a product at any point in time thus far that people could stand up and say, I love this product. This is right. This is done. I'm, I'm going to support this because we were in a process to develop one. But yet we had people in the debate and the discussion on both sides, and you can see signs that say, I hate Codenex. Uh, or Code Next is going to destroy my neighborhood, or Code Next isn't going to do enough to, to bring us into the place we need to be. Then it's frustrating sometimes to look at that and say, you know, it, it's a process, not a product, so there's nothing yet. People come up to me all the time with photographs, and they say, see this displacement that's happening? See this home across the picture, uh, this home across the street from me that's being torn down. The family had to, to leave. Look at this picture of localized flooding in my neighborhood. Look at this picture of the traffic in my neighborhood. See this displacement. See, this is why I hate Code Next. And I look at them and I say, if you have a picture of it, it's not Code Next. Because Code Next didn't do any of those things. It's the current code and our current rules that are, that are responsible for any picture you can show to me. But with that said and with trying to keep people at the table and saying be part of the process because your worst fears, I don't think, I'm pretty sure, I'm nearly positive, are not going to get realized. Let's work as a community to make this better and take into account the competing interests that we have both the desire to protect neighborhoods as well as the desire to have opportunities for people to live in this city so they don't have to move farther and farther away. But how do you communicate that to 950,000 people when it's a process argument you're trying to convey which will never have the same emotional draw that, that, that can be fashioned? But you didn't want to put it on the ballot. 
it. Well, the, the law didn't let us put it on the ballot. And, and that's, you know, I, the law says uh, in Texas, as it is in every other state in the country, that, that you are allowed to put on the ballot two questions concerning zoning. Should you have zoning or should you not have zoning? So a city like Houston that doesn't have zoning can put on the ballot the question, do you want to have zoning in Houston? Or a city that has zoning, like Austin, we could put on the ballot, do we want to be like Houston? Do we just want to end zoning? Those two questions you can put on the ballot. But the question of putting on the ballot, do you like this zoning code or not? Are there changes, are these the changes you want to make to the zoning code? Or are there different changes you want to make to the zoning code? The law says we can't put that question on a ballot. So the council was faced with, a, with an incredibly hard and difficult question because there had been a petition uh, and you want to honor the petition that came, came in, uh, but yet it was asking for something that we were being advised was illegal by our staff. We asked them to get outside counsel. They did, who confirmed it. I then went to the dean of the law school and I said, Dean, do you have anybody on the faculty at the University of Texas? No money, no one's gonna pay. Is there someone who could weigh in on whether this is right or not? And they, he got me to the, the professor on the faculty that was their top municipal person who said, rather than me, because I live in this town, let me get you to the national guy who's lead on this. He was a professor at NYU. We went to him and he confirmed it. So what we did was, while we didn't have to take the vote not to put it on the ballot until August, I asked us to take this vote as quickly as we could so as to give everybody and anybody the opportunity to raise a judicial challenge so that if we're wrong about this, there's still time to put it on the ballot in November. And that's what's happening now. One more, let's do one more audience question before we... We get this question Goodbye. often, and I always appreciate it. I know that we'll end with a call to action for us personally, but as we look more globally, we know that things are going really well in Austin. What are the other places that you look to? What are the other cities, the other leaders around the country and even around the world that really inspire you and help you make decisions here in Austin? Boy, there are so many. Not Kim Jong-un. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing. You know, the, 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 the international mayors that, that I really look up to are, are people like uh, um, uh, Sada Khan in, in London, who I think is, is doing great things on equity issues. Uh, uh, one of my personal mentors and someone I think is super is Anne Hildago, who's the mayor in Paris, uh, who is the, the head of the C40, the, 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 the most involved and active and productive cities doing climate change work. Started out with 40 cities. Austin, by the way, is one of those cities. Uh, and she's asked us now to apply to bring the international meeting to Austin, which would be pretty incredible. Uh, but then even small mayors, uh, like uh, Mayor uh, uh, Nordstrom in, in Lulia, uh, in, in, in Sweden, uh, who's, who's elevating a, a city and bringing his city forward uh, with incredible growth it's kind of like Austin, but on a much smaller scale. Uh, there are w wonderful mayors in, in, in the United States. Uh, uh, Eric Garcetti in, in Los Angeles is doing great work and, and making progress on so many different er areas. Um, uh, Mayor Landro in New Orleans, who just left office, did uh, one of the most amazing speeches I've ever seen concerning Confederate uh, uh, statues. Uh, Mayor Wheeler in, in, in Portland, uh, I think, is doing a, an incredible job. Um, uh, the mayor in uh, Louisville, Fisher, is doing a great job. I was a really big fan of the mayor in Nashville, who is no longer in that position uh, because she had uh, issues outside of, of the performance of her duty, but she was doing incredible things in Nashville. There are lots, you know, cities, we, you know, Cities compete against each other, but only 5% of the time, 95% of the time, cities are sharing with each other and we're stealing ideas from each other. Because quite frankly, if any city in this country could solve gentrification, I mean, I would love for any city to be able to do that just so that I could do what they do. 
Uh, so cities are constantly egging each other on and pushing each other and stealing from each other uh, because by and large uh, uh, we, we act in concert, we don't compete. I'm running out of time, I have two quick questions. One really is a call to action, but the final question is, what did you, oh, sorry, Siri thought I was asking a question to Siri. <laughs> no, Siri, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to the mayor. <laughs> What, what did you observe and learn about our community's personality during the bombing crisis in March? I was really, I was really proud of the, of the community uh, during the bombing uh, and parts of the community. Uh, uh, we have a, a member of the police force here with us today at the front table, and you guys did just an incredible job. Um, <laughs> The whole thing was handled at, at that level in a way that you would want Austin to be handling those things. And, and there's not time now but to, but to tell the story about what happened at the end where we had uh, 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 dozens of police officers charging a car that they knew was going to explode when the decision had been made not to do that until uh, protective gear had, had arrived. And, he started driving before it had arrived, and they stopped the car. And, and, and you, you hear stories in other cities about people that run to danger when everybody else is running away. But I hope at some point that the public gets to see the video of our law enforcement agents charging that car and then it exploding just as, as, as everyone had feared it would do. Uh, you guys did great, and this community is appreciative beyond measure for what you guys have done. But it was also the community coming together. It was a community that, that stayed focused. You know, the message was, if you see something that's suspicious, don't touch it, call in. And there were lots of people in the community that did that. That call, that quat request to be more observant on it became part of what it was that, that enabled this to be resolved the way that it was resolved and on the timing that it was resolved. You could feel the community kind of fraying toward the end when the tripwire became yet another uh, way and people were now beginning to confront the question of whether they should let their children go to parks. Uh, so, so thank God that, that, that we were able to resolve it quickly. Uh, but I'm also real appreciative of how this community try, is trying to grow from this going forward. And, and I am in a lot of groups around the city and I get asked the question frequently about what we had talked about at the end, which was get to know your neighbors better. Mm -hmm. You know, things are less suspicious the more you know the person that lives across the street and down the street. If you know everyone around you, things are just less suspicious. You know more of what's going on and beyond that, if I know the person that lives across the street or across the hall or upstairs or downstairs, there's a better chance that if I need help, someone's going to know that I need help and can help me get it. Or I'll have a better idea that somebody needs help and I'll be better able to try to help get them help. What we learned is that we don't know our neighbors as well as we should. Uh, but this is also a community, I think, that is embracing that concept uh, to, to grow from this and to end up uh, in a better place than we went into it. We're out of time, but I want a quick call to action because this is a room full of future and present leaders in all aspects of our wonderful city. What are some actionable ways, or even just one actionable ways, all of us can do a better job staying focused on making Austin a better city and, a, and, a, and an even greater place to live. So how many people in this room have attended or signed up to attend that diversity um, uh, conversation? How many people have not? Okay, for everyone who has their hand raised now, that would be my call to action. And I would say that not only because this experience will prove to be a much greater value than you can imagine, because it will, based on the experience that everyone else has had, but because this organization is taking leadership on this issue and with respect to those conversations, and because, you know, I, I went in this conversation 
as I participated as part of the task force on, on institutional racism, went through the training, and we were all, our minds were just blown from participating in that, everybody collectively in that. And, and I walked out and I went to the trainer and I said, this is great messaging, this is really important stuff. How do I bring this to 950,000 people? What's the method for that? And we're trying to work on messaging that, that we can do at a mass level to do as best as we can. But the real answer to that question really is like Johnny Appleseed. It is one person at a time going through that session and then talking to 20 people about it because you will, having gone through this. And it's the coalitions that form around that. Your organization is doing this. It's taken the lead on this. And thank goodness because of the, the leaders that self-select for this and the reach that you have in the community, if everybody in this room, in this room, participated in that program, this city would be changed given the reach and the leadership positions that everybody in this community has. That would be my call to action. Wonderful. Please join me in thanking Mayor Adler for the great <laughs> leadership he provides this wonderful place we call home. Thank you, Mayor Adler. Thank you.